Hey, Shio, hello, and welcome to the 13th presentation of our Indigenous Speaker Series. The Indigenous Education Institute is proud to present today's webinar entitled Inside Indigenous Classrooms, featuring collaborative maker places with NASA Easy Mission Program Manager, Dr. Nelafar Mosavi, Indigenous students, Maverick teachers, Lego robotics, and more. My name is Dr. Nancy Maryboy, and I'm the founding president and executive <clears throat> director of the Indigenous Education Institute, or IEI. I'm Dine and Cherokee, and have been working in the area of Indigenous education for many years. My Navajo clan is um, the, my Navajo clans are our um, Deer Springs clan and um, Honeycomb Rock Dweller, Cliff, Cliff Dweller clan, or Senjakini, it's easier in Navajo. Um, the IEI, along with NASA's Heliophysics Education Activation Team, NASA HEAT, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, and the NASA EASY Mission, is proud and honored to present a sense of place Indigenous Perspectives of Earth, Water, and Sky. We have called today's program Inside Indigenous Classrooms, Collaborative Maker Places with the Easy Mission. This session features Dr. Nilifer, Nilifer Mosavi, the program manager for the NASA's Easy Mission. It also features what we call Maverick, meaning exceptional teachers from four Indigenous schools and their students who will be presenting their work involving educational resources and materials which they have received from the EC mission. I would like to begin our series today with a heartfelt acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples of the world to honor our many participants from around the world today. Usually we acknowledge the land on which we are living or presenting, but in this day and age of virtual online realities, we are honoring all indigenous peoples around the world. IEI is a nonprofit institution with an all indigenous board and staff <clears throat> that has been in existence for over 25 years. We are located on San Juan Island, Washington state and on the Navajo nation. Our mission is to preserve, protect and apply traditional indigenous ways of knowing to contemporary life with a focus on native education, environmental change, and sustainable healthy environments on the earth, the water, and in the skies. Much of our work concerns the creation of collaborations with integrity between Western science and traditional indigenous ways of knowing. The presentations in this series have been chosen to reflect an awareness of the foundations of traditional indigenous thinking and living in our native ways, everything is interconnected. So rather than a specific focus on biology, astronomy, or other separate disciplines, we will be presenting worlds of interrelationships and processes of reciprocity. Another focus for this speaker series is expanding awareness and understanding for cultural differences to support more successful and diverse working relationships whether it be education, national resource management, NASA, museums, science centers, or tribal communities. I want to thank you personally for attending this webinar. The interest you have shown is overwhelming. We have over 300 people registered from all across the United States, and we have participants from around the world, including Canada, Barbados, Brazil, Austria, and Puerto Rico. It is also interesting and heartwarming for me that we have more than 100 tribes represented in our, in our registrations for this presentation today. The IEI Maker Place Network operates as a resource center design studio and test bed for Indigenous schools. The project is funded by the Easy Mission, which studies the Aurora, the Northern Lights, as a natural phenomena which interacts with our sun and its magnetosphere. 
Teachers and students explore and share innovative ideas that connect the easy mission with a wide array of technologies typically found in maker places. This network expands the easy missions ability to impact indigenous learning environments by building long lasting relationships with mission leaders by drawing culturally relevant knowledge from an indigenous advisory group and by encouraging indigenous youth to participate in rich heliophysics maker place projects while respecting cultural norms and values. The mission will launch in 2024. We are happy and honored to have Dr. Jesper, the mission director here in the audience. And because I can't, I can't say your last name the way you said it, I'll just call you Dr. Jesper, Jesper G. This presentation is being recorded. Most of our presentations for the sense of place Indigenous Perspectives on Earth and Sky presentations have been recorded and can be accessed at the Indigenous Education Institute website shortly following the events. Since you have registered by email, we will also share notices to you for more upcoming presentations. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ben Jones and Keanu Jones from Karma, which is AYA Advanced Rural Manufacturing Alliance, located on the Navajo Nation, to speak about the importance of maker places. And um, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Ben Jones and Keanu Jones. Thank you uh, for that roaring introduction, Nancy. Um, my name is uh, Ben Jones. I do やっぱりそのタイミングとでね、いや。ま、こっちにいいんでしょうか。どう、どう、どう、どう、どう、どう、どう、どう、どう、どう、どう、どう、どう、どう、どう、どう、どう、どう、どう、どう、どう、どう、
Women's Initiative with K-12 Development emphasizes the work with the LEGO Foundation's initiative with playful and engineering-based learning, zero robotics coding competition, the instructional and cultural manual developments on STEM engineering learning. Additional initiatives include distributive design and manufacturing, the teacher fellow cohort, the maker place, entrepreneurship with an emphasis on tech-based economic development, precision agriculture and water catchment, and cultural integration as all priorities of focus. As a result, Karma hosted two K-12 InnoVenture product challenges that foster creativity, engineering, design process, and entrepreneurship. We believe that all these skills are critical for indigenous youth to thrive in the 21st century workforce. The intelligence of our Navajo culture has always been promoted through our language, our songs, our belief systems, our prayers, even through our arts and crafts, and they were produced in our weaving. Our culture has always reflected that advanced uh, visionary way of looking at things. We visualize, we frame it in our minds, and through using our coordination between hand and eye coordination, we produce those desired images in our mind. So 3Ds is no different. It's just the way we have always done. So our culture has always been advanced in those areas. Bridging cultural practices and modernizing the process could create a new market for the Navajo Nation. Try and start getting uh, young people to think about entrepreneurship and the possibilities of running their own business. And lots of times in rural communities, um, which we have a lot of in New Mexico, that may be your only opportunity to stay there. So we have a lot of the same objectives as the Navajo Nation does in providing opportunities to rural communities, as well as uh, providing resources and support for those who are maybe later in life looking to pursue entrepreneurship, maybe as a second career. What does it mean to be a Navajo entrepreneur? One example can be a weaver. The process begins by conceptualizing a potential rug or 3D product. Weavers create a basic sketch of their design, while 3D printer users structure their design using 3D modeling software. Next, the weaver begins to prepare their loom to generate a rug. The 3D printer and loom are structured similarly. Both use a source of filament that creates their product. After the completion of the products, the weaver begins to prepare the rug for the market. In this instance, the market for a weaver is the trading post. The trading post then pays the weaver for her rug, allowing the weaver to provide for their family and is an entrepreneur. The technology enables any individual to harvest a new generation of Navajo entrepreneurs. These Navajo entrepreneurs could continue the efforts of being a self-sufficient nation and carry the traditions of culture through technology. It's fun, it teaches you a lot of things about 3D printing, how to work a printer, what not to do on 3D printer. It was interesting. Uh, I learned a lot of stuff here. I never learned anything like it, basically. And it's just a fun activity to do. Karma's vision of a maker place is a collaborative place that serves as a hub for research, experimentation, and innovation to solve community challenges. It is a multidisciplinary environment where individuals from diverse backgrounds, such as filmmakers, artists, designers, engineers, and researchers, come together to explore the intersection of technology, media, and storytelling. The maker place provides access to state-of-the-art equipment, software, and resources necessary for the creation and production of various forms of media, virtual reality experiences, 3D modeling, and design prototyping. These labs foster an environment of creativity, collaboration, and experimentation, encouraging individuals to push the boundaries of traditional practices and explore new modes of problem solving. The Maker Place resonates with the Navajo hero twins journey to the sun in search of their father. As they returned from a successful journey, they were armed with weapons to slay threats to their homeland. 
Karma's Maker Place is the emergence of using 21st century tools to combat modern day threats. Karma continues their efforts by exposing these ideas and models with their established relationships with Navajo K-12 schools. As a result, they held their second annual InnoVenture Product Challenge. The InnoVenture Product Challenge tasks the students to design a Navajo theme Head Start toy. Karma is seeking opportunities to weave cultural practices and technology to sprout future Navajo entrepreneurs to create economic stability on the Navajo Nation. You just want to show the, the video that does a better job and kind of telling the story of karma as well. So, so uh, with some of the pressing questions um, that we're currently uh, talking um, is this whole um, artificial intelligence and and then uh, the idea that you know we we have this um, this culture uh, long enduring culture but uh what does ai either bring as a benefit or as a threat so those are real questions i think we we need to be concerned about as well and as well as our, our children or students and teachers so i think we're right on that mark nancy yeah perfect timing and beautiful video thank you that adds so much music and the interviews thank you so much um now it's my pleasure to introduce who we call nelly um dr nella Farmosavi, who is the program manager from the easy mission and so i will turn it over to you thank you so much nancy um I will share my screen. Put it on a presentation mode. Can you see my slides in the presentation mode? Yes. Okay, excellent. Beautiful. Uh, so thank you so much. And Dr. Mary Boy, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, part of this um, great audience. Easy, I'm very happy to be presenting Easy Mission on behalf of our amazing team, Easy Mission. Uh, I'm Nelly Mosavi. I'm the project manager of Easy, and we'll talk about Easy a little bit more in depth. What is Easy? So, Easy, it's a heliophysics mission. We were awarded in 2001. We have actually about 16 months to launch, so we are halfway to our mission now. So uh, we are part of the heliophysics, and what you see here in this uh, picture, it's a very busy picture with so many uh, spacecraft, and easy is just one piece of uh, this amazing division of NASA. Why is it so many uh, spacecraft in this picture? Because the heliophysics is the physics of the sun, and its connection with our solar system. And it's a very complex issue. And for any complex issue, uh, not one mission, not one institute can solve that. It requires a collaboration, of collaboration between different institutes, be be between different organizations, and also international uh, partnership. So uh, we wanted to just bring this picture and say, the heliophysics, it's a very complex, the connection between sun and earth, it's very complex, and every complex issue requires a great collaboration. Easy mission, so, and just for example, at this time, these are just the pictures of the operating missions, 20 operating mission with 20 space, 27 spacecraft currently right now, and this does not include the missions that have successfully completed their mission. So, uh, or, but one thing that it's very common between all these missions that for the heliophysics, not only we focus mm -hmm. on studying the sun, but this is a life cycle of every mission. Every mission needs to have a purpose. It needs to have science objectives. It needs to have a design and build uh, 
program and then a lot of testing and launch and mission operation. It's a huge cycle and it's a lot of team members. It requires a lot of collaborations. Again, I am uh, highlighting collaborations because in any complex a mission like a space mission, a collaboration and engagement is very important. Not only it's important to make the mission happen, but it's also important to tell about the story of the mission and the mission purpose. So this is a great opportunity for us to be part of this community and talk about easy more in depth. Uh, the mission purpose, as I said, this is a part of the heliophysics. So before I get in depth about easy mission, I want to talk a little bit about the sun. So um, sun, as I mentioned, it's a very complex phenomenon. And every second the sun is, you know, spits about 1.9 billion kilograms of charged particles in every direction. And these stream of particles is called solar wind. And the solar wind carries these particles toward Earth with the very highest speed, up to a million miles per hour. So just imagine the amount of these particles are that are coming to Earth. This by itself is very complex. And the activity of the sun surface is uh, very uh, complex. And it's called uh, this kind of uh, surface, the sun surface that creates a type of the weather that is called the space weather. Uh, can actually affect the Earth. Although the sun is very far away, about 150 million kilometers away from the sun, these uh, solar winds uh, can cause interference on Earth, on the, our astronauts in our power lines. So it's a very complex and important part of um, the heliophysics to understand that. So we talked about high energy particles. We talked about the complexity. So how are we protected with those complex particles? We are very lucky on Earth that we have the Earth's magnetic field protect us. The blue lines on the right, you will see the Earth's magnetic field that is uh, like a shield that is protecting us and also the Earth's atmosphere. So the combination of the uh, magnetic field and atmosphere is uh, Really, it's like a shield that protects us from the sun. But as I show in this picture on the right, this is a simplified picture of the magnetic Earth's magnetic field. You see the North Pole and South Poles. You, it's the magnetic fields are less. So if there are chances for the solar particles to uh, sneak in, this North Pole and South Pole are really good areas for the charged particles to sneak in. And when they do that, uh, you know, when those high energy particles charge the, uh, you know, hit the atmosphere, that's where you see the glowing light, um, the aurora. For example, here, it's the aurora, the oxygen glows. Uh, when the, uh, those high energy particle hits the oxygen, for example, you see uh, the green light. Or when they hit the nitrogen, you see the blue or purple lights. Uh, so uh, one of the phenomena on North Pole, it's the aurora, but other part that we also at Easy Mission, we like to focus, it's um, the link between the Earth and the sun. So uh, the, the flow of the solar energy particles in Earth's upper atmosphere creates about a 100,000 100, miles long electrical current flowing along the magnetic field. And these currents are very complex and there are different theories of the, how these current links exist. But for the first time, the easy mission will go and map those and will uh, understand how exactly these current links, uh, the direction of it and how it's established. So uh, I told, I mentioned in the beginning, there is a mission purpose for every mission. And our purpose really is to understand the link between Earth and space, help to understand the space weather more effectively. Uh, as we are talking about sending, uh, you know, astronauts to Moon, Mars, understanding the solar weather and predicting it, it's more important than ever. Uh, we want to have a way to you know, very accurately uh, predict those space weather. So we can tell the astronaut, you can go for a spacewalk today at Mars. You can walk, have a walk in the moon today. It's safe for you. Or when is it not safe? So 
understanding the space, whether it's a huge part of the uh, future of a space domain, and also just the impact of the, on the Earth, what impact those solar winds and the space weather can have on Earth, it's very important. So we are very proud of our mission purpose and our science objectives. So as I mentioned, the EASY likes to study the electrical current in Earth's atmosphere, and that's the fundamental of the energy transfer with sun and earth system. To have a connection, it's really to with anything, it's understanding the connections and how the connection happens is the first step to any communications. So this mission will open the communication to many unknowns that we don't even know. So how do we do that? Uh, we do it with the uh, Collaboration, this mission is a collaboration between Jet Propulsion Lab, JPL, Blue Canyon Technology, BCT for the spacecraft, and APL. So the three organizations, they have a history of collaboration. They have a history of uh, making mission, uh, space missions happen. And this is a great collaboration for making this mission happen. So we've been doing a lot of designing requirements. As I mentioned, we are halfway on our uh, life cycle of our mission. Uh, we've just started building the hardware, the hardware for both instrument and the spacecraft. Uh, every mission, it's again, it's a close collaboration between the scientists and the engineers. The scientists are the ones who create the theories. The engineers are the ones who implement them. They complement each other. They often work together. The scientists want to get more science and the engineers, they want to be realistic and say, okay, you want this science, but is it capable with the power, the funding, the you know technology maturity? So uh, it's a very great engagement throughout the process of the life cycle of the mission. Here, I'm just showing a, a mission operations. Before the mission operation, there is a mission launch that I don't have a picture of a launch, but the launch of the spacecraft, because we haven't launched yet, but every mission, the launch of it is uh, one of the most powerful moment of the mission, because that's when the mission actually um, you know, it's a birth to the mission. You will see all the hard work that you've done over the years and it becomes to fruition. So um, let me just, sorry. I want to see if I can um, play this video. So this is this easy mission. It's included three spacecraft, three spacecraft. At this picture, they are, you know, um, Looking at the solar, the solar panels is charging. The first one, it's doing a calibration. The first one is making science measurement as it comes to the aurora part. So the three spacecraft are following each other about two to uh, 10 minutes apart from each other. The first one is looking at the coldest sky for calibration again. This mission is very unique because we don't have a propulsion. So you, we are using differential drag to uh, keep those uh, separation two to 10 minutes apart from each other. So it's a lot of new technology that it's using this mission. Uh, the orbit, the attitude, it's about 675 kilometers uh, up to 425 kilometers during the uh, launch. Uh, the orbital period, it's about 100 minutes. We will have 15 orbits uh, of science measurement during the day. And um, the, or the mission after we launch, it will have two months of, uh, two months of primary launch and 18 months of, um, 16 months of science. So there will be a lot of great science um, collected by this mission. So again, our mission is to discover, uh, understand the link between earth and science, but also one of other uh, goal of this mission is outreach. We are very big about outreach. We want to uh, make sure the new generations, it's also be part of our science team. This is the first NASA mission that actually uh, the youngest students, they can be along with our scientists making measurements. So these three spacecraft will make measurements from the top. And for the first time, the students will have an opportunity to use these ground magnetometers that we will be sending 700 of them 
around the country and also globally as well. And our goal is to uh, make sure uh, that everybody has the opportunity that is interested to be part of this. So if you're interested to be part of our Easy Mag project, please check our website. If you just uh, type Easy Mag in YouTube, you will see a nice video of our outreach and it will talk about how you can become a citizen science, how you can become a, a science, you know, a student scientist uh, and part of the easy mission and contribute to our uh, mission. Uh, so our goal is to observe the world, connect the world, collect the data, uh, connect the data, and make sure that we create a memorable and meaningful experience for students and uh, get them to be a, a future scientist and uh, get involved with STEM from early on. This is the Easy, Ta uh, Easy Mac team. Uh, I just want to also, so Jasper, Dr. Uh, Gallo, he's, uh, that, he's part of this uh, call today, and uh, Rob Barnes, that he's also the inventor of the Easy Mac. And I also want to give a special thanks to Troy Klein to connect us to the IEEI and um, Sandra Velvik for uh, all the great work that she's doing the Easy Mag. So uh, again, this is a collaboration between a great team, and we are very happy to be here today and talk about our mission. And um, I hope that you follow the mission to the lunch and be part of collecting data for us. Thank you, Nellie. That was a wonderful presentation. And um, and love all the photos, too. It's terrific. Um, all right. Now we're going to I'm going to introduce Tom Thomas from Little Singer Community School. And we have um, four wonderful schools here that are going to be talking about their uh, what they're doing with this kind of information in the classroom and with the resources that are being provided for them. So, Tom, I'm turning it over to you. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nancy. And can you see uh, where it says Kua'akala on the screen? Looking good. Yes? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So, yeah, it's a Tom Thomas initia. Austrian Nishla, Asas Lorraine, Bashis Chin, Do German A, Dasha Che, Lithuanian, Dasha Nella. And I've been honored to teach within our Diné or Navajo Nation and community schools for a little over 32 years. And we'll get right into the introduction of Emily Engel King and her dynamic teaching there at Kua Kala Charter School. She's an academic coach. And Little Singer and Kua Kala Charter School have been sister schools for about 20 years now. And we'll get right into her presentation. Here we go. Aloha mai kako o Emily Ko'u Inoa e kumu auma kua okala o Hawaii kuu mukapuni. My name is Emily Ingo King and I am the academic coach at Kua Okala Public Charter School down in Hilo, Hawaii. And I am so excited to have the opportunity to share with you our, our end of year ho'ike, or the celebration of our knowledge and learning so far in this amazing collaborative opportunity with the EASY team and the other Indigenous communities involved in this partnership. Uh, alas, we are not able to be with you all in person, <laughs> because today, Thursday, we are celebrating and promoting our sixth graders on to their next steps in their own academic adventures as they leave our school today. But I do look forward to collaborating with you all in the coming months. Uh, we are very excited to share our vision and some of our ideas for where we are heading through this opportunity. And I Hope you enjoy and look forward to hearing you all. Let me also just start by saying mahalo i We are so grateful for what we have in this chance. And um, we have learned a lot. We are still figuring out a lot more than that, uh, but we are excited about what is to come. So thank you, thank you, thank you for granting us this opportunity. The Aurora Borealis, one of nature's most exquisite forms of scientific artistry. We thought, what better way to have our students encounter the Aurora Borealis than through artistic expression and visual arts found around the world. 
Our students first encountered the auroras through photography, through paintings and other various forms of visual arts, and then had the opportunity to express their own personal first impressions through literary arts in the form of haikus. You'll also hear some of our students' favorite facts that they've learned along the way. Aurora Borealis by William, like living in a river, warriors marching in the bright sky. Auroras constantly change shape due to the flow of charged particles and the varying magnetic fields. I like it because it explains how they move and make the night sky bright. River in the Sky by Olive. Bright and silky, a winding river in the sky. Raw beauty shining. I thought that it was really fascinating that the most common colors were are um, red and green in our Borealis. Long and beautiful, glorious lights in the sky takes my breath away. The best thing I learned about auroras this year is you might find them in cave paintings. Bathing light, bright arm, skimmy mountains bathed with light, beautiful to the naked eye, stunning. One interesting fact I learned about aurora borealises is that they not only occur on Earth, but they also occur on different planets in the solar system. The Night's Marching Band by James Lee. Dancing in the sky, aurora borealis. Aurora Borealis, beautiful in light. I learned that they're a sign of good luck. Our school's mission statement is to provide Hawaiian culturally driven, including values-based and place-based educational experiences through Palina Aina, Palina Kanaka, and Palina Uhane. That is the relationship with the land, relationship with mankind, and relationship with the spirit world. So our very fiber of our being here at Pua Opala is to help our students foster that relationship with the natural world, with humanity, and with what lies beyond what our five senses can teach us. We help our students explore these relationships through a process called kilo, which is a Hawaiian form of observation. Um, I have a colleague, Umumat, who's gonna share a little bit about just what that means, the process of kilo and the importance of it to the Hawaiian people. Oh, I just wanted to talk today about our kupuna as scientists. Um, right. The Hawaiian kupuna, our Hawaiian ancestor, were the greatest scientists of their time because they were the greatest observers of their time. They keloed on a daily basis and they pass that information on from generation to generation. When Christopher Columbus was leaving Spain, all the scientists in Europe told him that he was crazy and he was going over the edge. During that same time, our kupuna were sailing all over the Pacific, trading with each other using the stars, the winds, the waves, the sun and the moon, the birds, all the things, all the elements in nature that, that they keloed all the time and they observed all the time, helped them to be the greatest scientists of their time. They had a name for all the different types of rains, all the different types of winds, um, because there was a difference and they could see those differences. And um, that's just what made them the greatest scientists of their time. Thank you. In the coming semesters, we will continue to foster and cultivate our young citizen scientists in the ways of our kapuna and the almofua, the elders and the ancestors. The Hawaiians were known for their wayfinding, their navigation of the stars as they sought out new homes throughout the Pacific. We'll be learning from Kapuna in our area as we learn the ways of the wayfinders. We'll be studying the outrigger canoes as their journey throughout the world and circumnavigated the globe. We'll also explore that deep connection with the native Hawaiians and the skies and the heavens and everything that they had to offer. In further developing Palina Aina, Palina Kanaka, and Palina Uhane, 
Our students used the Tinkercad program and 3D printers to create Ohe Kapala, or Hawaiian stamps. Historically, these stamps would tell of, his, of major events, significant landmarks, one's identity, hopes and dreams, and so on. Our students told their own class mo'olelo, their class story. So we can see evidence in their designs here of the repeated patterns of connection and unity. We see that Hawaiian cultural connection to the kalo or the taro plant, which is probably the most important food to the Hawaiian people, being as it's the elder brother of mankind. <laughs> We also see the connection to the mahina or the moon and sea and sky and everything in between as evidenced by some of those mountain tops, those waves and those clouds. You see, of course, the volcanoes, which can't have a Hawaiian story without a volcano. So while many of these images represent many things, they're telling the story of who they are, where they've come from, and who they are becoming as a class and as individuals. I look forward to sharing the impact of the Easy Team, this learning community, and the Aurora Borealis will have on our keiki. The next school year will include a deep dive into Alelo Noeau, or the wise sayings of our ancestors. We will study these Hawaiian proverbs, worldwide mythologies and stories, songs and poetry seeking the connections that the ancients had with the earth and the heavens as we expand our own knowledge and the forces at play in the universe. While it's highly unlikely that we will ever see the aurora borealis in Hawaii, the students are excited to learn more about the natural phenomena and measure the magnetic energy surrounding us. We have several small-scale science experiments planned as we collaborate across curriculum matters to continue to research, discover, and explore. We are likening our voyage into the unknown to that of the ancestors in their outrigger canoes as they set out for a new place to come home. Our students have already made the connection to the easy satellites as the outrigger canoe of the auroras. So we will surf the wave of this metaphor right into next year as we continue to research, discover, and explore. I can't wait to share one of the most beautiful forms of storytelling with all of you as our students create a hula dance inspired by the Aurora Borealis, and maybe write a song or two. We'll have to see about that last one. I'll have to bring a subject matter expert in for that one as I lack the skills myself. That's another thing that we really look forward to doing is bringing in as many subject matter experts as we possibly can. Whether it's a local Hawaiian teaching us about wayfinding, whether it's a kumu, a hula kumu who can teach us more about the hula dance, maybe even break out the ukulele, but also of course, those of you here on this team, I can't wait to reach out to you and coordinate some kind of meeting so you can share everything that you know and be a little bit more scientific than I can on my own. Um, so thank you for making yourselves available through that. Through Kilo, scientific research and creative expression in various visual art forms, our journey into the heavens is just beginning and I wait with bated breath to traverse the skies with fellow Mavericks. Mahalo Nui for all that you do. Thank you for sharing your time, your talents, and your mana'o, your knowledge. Ahui ho, and have a great summer. Wow, what, what, um, what a connection that um, her students are making, seeing the easy satellites as the outrigger canoes of the auroras. Mm -hmm. um, definitely looking forward to hearing more about where, where um, she is leading her class and her school with this. Um, our next awe-inspiring educator, Miss um, Sarah Begay, a stellar maverick tag teacher of Greasewood Springs Community School, um, and also dear friend of over 30 years, um, will be presenting next. And let me go ahead and bring up her PowerPoint presentation. Can you see Greasewood Springs Community School across your screen? Yes. yes. Uh, excellent. Good. Excellent. There good, you go. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah Begay, originally from 
Rock Point, Arizona, USA, Sensabis, Aden, a Yasina Shah, but they son in Schlingo, but Ani Bashes Chin, Cochini, Dasha Chego, Dash Chini, Dashanelle. My mother was from Rock Point, my father from Mexican water area. Uh, thank you, Tom, for introducing our school to the to this easy project uh, at Gracewood Springs Community School. We started the program rather late in um, March. And uh, uh, this is our school. Go on, Tom. What we've done thus far was that we've introduced our students to engineering design and the art of creating 3D images using a uh, BlockCAD and Tinkercad to our fifth grade students and a sixth grade student. Uh, that sixth grade student was awesome because she created her 3D image at one sitting. 60% uh, of our students had created their designs and we've only made one uh, printing of a Hogan. Uh, our 3D printer, thank you to Dr. Jane Jones, who uh, supplied the 3D printer that was set up by our good friend, James Rollison. Uh, we talked, uh, Mr. Rollison and I, that we would focus more on using the 3D printer. And hopefully uh, we start printing some of those images uh, next month when our summer enrichment program starts. Uh, just to let you know, at our school, during the month of April, it was entirely devoted to the end of the year summative assessment. And uh, I mean, it was a three week long event. And then uh, whatever was remaining of the school year in May was dev devoted to uh, the end of the year activities such as field trips, field days, and other events. So uh, these were what we've accomplished thus far. Uh, go on to the next slide, Tom. During the summer enrichment program in June, we are going to resume the Easy Maker Place project. And um, at this point in time, we want to focus on the seventh and eighth grade students, but we also will keep the fourth, the fifth and sixth grade students um, in the loop. Our emphasis will be on uh, STEM topics related to the sun science missions, such as the easy mission. And that's the website we'll use. The Parker Solar Probes, followed by the website we'll be using we will also introduce heliophysics and we will use the websites you see there. Uh, in addition, we'll also uh, introduce Aurora Borealis. And um, this week I've been researching, I've been Googling for information. And uh, I really liked the presentation by Excuse me for saying this, but uh, Nelly, I hope that we will access uh, her presentation to use in uh, introducing the Easy Mission Project to our students. Uh, so these are our plans for the month long summer enrichment program. We do have teachers who are interested in. Uh, uh, coding, robotics, mm -hmm. and uh, we will dabble with that to some degree as well. But our main focus will be the easy mission in addition to the 3D uh, printing project. Uh, go on to the next slide, Tom. These are some of the projects we aim to focus on. Uh, Dr. Bolos, uh, once upon a time, introduced to some of my students the I Wonder poem, 
and I want to dabble with that, uh, 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 you know, toward the end of uh, our um, event in uh, June. We want to do some illustrations of Aurora Borealis, the way the students understand it, and then research, of course, the Northern Lights, and then find out if there are any Navajo connection or relevance to the Northern Lights, if there are such words, um, if they have them in their prayers, ceremonies, or any type of connection. And then um, other ideas that will yet come to be. So this is my presentation for Breezewood Springs Community School. And Tom, <laughs> thank you for keeping me in the loop. And um, thank you to all of you. So. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Sarah. And uh, maybe perhaps uh, later when Dr. David Begay speaks, you can address your, your fourth bullet, their Navajo connect, connection or re relevance to Aurora Borealis. And uh, thank you so much, Sarah, for all you do and, and uh, always being a, a role model for academic rigor as well. And we'll go ahead and oops, stop sharing on that one. And let me go ahead and go to... Um, Another, let's see here, let me go ahead and stop this here. And here, here. And so on this next part of our presentation, um, it's my honor to go ahead and introduce uh, my colleague and co-teacher, a Maverick teacher, Miss Wolfina Basenti. Um, this next 10 minutes will be uh, she'll be presenting for about half the portion of the time, and then I'll be sharing uh, what the fifth, sixth grade students here at Little Singer have been doing. Uh, Ms. Wolfina Basenti is our dynamic Dine language and culture teacher who is constantly researching and asking questions about connections and drawing forth. How do we draw forth Dine consciousness, Dine language and culture into our teachings today? And so with for, no further ado, here we go. Yeah, she ain't has a shin shlido, kia ani bushes chin. Can't the cheat need a shake, cut cheat need a shinale. Twas a conde, a dahilena, or yede is in Asha. My name is Wolfina Vicente, and I teach here at Little Singer School. I've taught the Nell language and culture for six years. I just want to say thank you for allowing me to contribute to the learning and teaching about the Easy Maker Place project. Um, challenging my thinking. As we learn with our students uh, from a Dine perspective, we, we know that it is always a central part of our teachings. We continue to always teach about relationships that we have with our Mother Earth, um, Father Sky, and everything that lives within that space. The four-legged animals, the, the reptiles, the birds, the water beings, and humankind. So we know there's life in each of these beings. And so there's a sense of respect and responsibility to these beings. And so that's the basis of what we teach our kids. And this awareness is really the basis of where our strained vision came from. The neck echo hinago which is making thoughts and learning come alive using the net teachings. So these two model the Dene engineering process and the five character traits we often use with our students because it contains a lot of uh, traditional knowledge that was passed down through our generations. The Dene engineering process is a four-step process that was really simplified so our students are able to identify with its own traditional content and which makes it easier for them to apply it to their learning and engineering projects. On Saha case, is the first step is thinking about it, not planning it, making it, and testing and improving on, on, on their projects. So this other model, the five and their character traits of leadership, is also a model that we use with our students. Again, you can see a corn is familiar to our students, and in our culture, it is a representation of growth and intelligence. So we focus on a growth mindset 
and we establish um, a connoisseur awareness, the life of our words, uh, respect, and the confidence building that we have with our students. And we teach all this through the concept of corn. What is the easy mission? As we apply the Dine engineering process model, brainstorming ideas and connecting the way of thought to this mission, um, we could make some connections like how in our cultural stories, the sun is talked about as though it has a human character form with certain human character behaviors and how those behaviors also affects the surroundings. In this case, how does the sun's behavior affect the earth? Mm -hmm. The sun's character has always been referred to as a dangerous type being. But on the other hand, it also offers valuable resources that can be used in positive ways to uh, here on earth. So how are some of sun's behaviors beneficial to the earth? So these are just example discussions and brainstorming ideas students could start with to uh, further their own understanding of what's being studied with the easy mission. And what are, what are the relationships? What are they affecting? How can we measure those relationships and what do those relationships look like? And even more questions, what is the solar storm in the way of thinking and understanding? What is the magnetosphere? What are the stories of the Northern Lights? So uh, lots of questions already from the beginning, um, because this, these are things that we don't think about every day. So asking these questions will bring new vocabulary and understanding. It might even bring new conversations that were forgotten. It might bring new teachings, and that's what we want our kids to do is research uh, their own cultural stories. When it comes to character building, students will reinforce what they already know about the relationship between the father, son, and mother earth, and how they fit into that. It also brings new awareness for their, um, of their natural surroundings, and such as uh, what they understand about the connection between the sun and the northern lights. Um, they'll build their vocabulary, their, their new way of thought, um, all of this will bring real respect and appreciation for nature and the beauty of it. And also understand what is considered sacred to us and how there are certain boundaries that are critical that we don't cross. And in the end, it builds their self-confidence and appreciate how they interact with the sacredness of their everyday surroundings. Thank you. Kahat. One of the things as Ms. Vicente emphasized is the values for practices of eh, honoring our relations. So one of the things that, that we look at are the sun, mother earth, moon, self, shadow, and aurora relationships. The students also studied our sun as our closest star, looking at it as a natural system with boundaries, components, properties, inputs, outputs, and interactions, systems thinking. They learned that space is not empty. They learned that the sun is constantly throwing out charged particles and that solar weather interacts with Earth's magnetosphere and it pushes in on Earth's magnetosphere and it's constantly a dynamic relationship. That's between the sun and the Earth and ourselves. And the, sun, the students learned about why the Earth has an active dynamic magnetosphere with the the core being a dynamo, a natural dynamo. And then what are the properties of the inner core? And then the students got to study the magnetosphere from various perspectives and various forms of resources from NASA, from the easy mission. We also got to take a look at significant events in Earth's history regarding solar weather pushing in on our Earth's magnetosphere, such as the 1859 Carrington solar storm, and then more recent ones that even knocked out Toronto's grid. We have a few poems that we'd like to share with you, Sin Cain poems that our, our fifth and sixth graders wrote as inspired by the Aurora Borealis. Great. 
late Aurora, by Riding John, Northern Emerald Green, bright colors in the sky, moving like rivers flowing so vivid. Aurora skies, by from Pierce Jackson, night sky, awesome blush night, like water colored dye in the bright green glimpse of an eye, awesome. Light show by Noah, movement bright, brilliant lights of the aurora, gleaming of greens and blues at night shimmer. We live and work so far south latitude that we rarely get to experience the aurora borealis. However, on April 23rd and 24th, the aurora showed itself here in northern Arizona. People in Flagstaff evidenced it and all sort of our kingdom. Hey, index was up to level eight. And on those days that it was at eight, we were able to see the Aurora Borealis this far south. Now our students went ahead and studied the EZ mission, the EZ satellites and the components inside the satellites. And they focused in on about eight of the components inside the EZ satellite. And after Dr. Mosavi came in one morning and through Zoom and presented to the children on how to understand six of the major components inside the housing of the satellite, the students went ahead and then proceeded to pre do oral presentations. The students also went ahead and illustrated, drew diagrams of the, the easy satellites, modeled it with modeling clay, and then went to the Tinkercad software online and constructed the easy satellites, printed out with a 3D printer, three of each model to replicate or rep and represent the easy satellites. We also invited in Randall Wilson, a local artist who painted observations that he had of the Aurora Borealis above his home about 20 years ago. We also invited in Dr. Annette Lee, a scientist and artist, who zoomed into the classroom and presented on the Aurora Borealis from her Lakota and Ojibwe perspectives. So we have um, here at Little Center Community School established a really dynamic learning and teaching team that expands beyond, well beyond, as you can see, well beyond the campus uh, to our subject matter experts zooming in like Dr. Musavi, and then we also have the, the teachers collaborating from the various campuses. Um, and then we're also learning from the Aurora itself as a teacher. I'd like to go ahead and introduce next, uh, Ms. Gazel Naha, a Dynamo uh, teacher, tag teacher, talented and gifted teacher at Second Mesa Day School. She has one of the most spectacular maker places I have ever been immersed in. Uh, Gazel, the floor is yours, take it away. All right, can you hear me guys? Yeah? Let me see. Uh, Mr. Thomas, I just wanna make sure that every time I share some video, yes. the sound will be okay. heard. Sounds good, Ali. So I'm hoping that this is going to be um, smooth. Anyway, so I'm Gazel Naha and I'm from um, Second Mesa Day School. And I live out here on the reservation, a Hopi reservation, 90 miles east of Flagstaff. And I've been teaching here for 15 years. And um, I teach second grade and gifted and talented students. Let's see. Okay, way too fast. So um, our school mission is Ita Tata Yomopekya, which means children come first. So uh, we provide um, positive and safe learning environment here at the school based on the strengths and values of our Hopi community. Um, through a cooperative effort among the students, parents, educators, and community members, our children acquire skills to be responsible and productive members of ever-changing world. 
So the keyword there is ever-changing world. So that's how I'm going to connect easy mission satellite, um, Aurora Borealis lessons into our school. So you will see in a little bit of our um, um, excellent um, presentation from our students. Okay, this is just about me. Um, okay, so we actually started, um, I was, I started teaching coding way back for so many years now with my gifted and talented students. And so my students kind of have like a background in coding. And so this is, um, this is, a, a, it was a little bit easier for them when they started coding and using Tinkercad, like what Mr. Thomas suggested to me. That really was helpful. We started with BlocksCAD and then we changed to Tinkercad. And then he also introduced us, you know, the Lego Prime, Spike Prime Lab, you know, that was, you know, uh, from Pharma, of course. Uh, we worked hand in hand with uh, Tufts University with uh, Dr. Allison uh, Earnhardt. And um, so the students actually created like, you know, rovers, robot, uh, robots using the, the Legos, and um, of course, in connection with the Hopi culture. So the, the goal was they will be creating robots or rovers that will help them in agriculture. You know, Native Americans are uh, really into agriculture. And so I told them, you know, especially the Hopi community out here, you know, um, so they created like rovers. And I know that Dr. Jones, when they visited out here with the other um, um, nonprofit organization, they were able to see the students in action. And so these are just some of their work. You know, they we talked about magnetosphere. So these are some of their STEAM activity. And they were able to <clears throat> use this clay right here in the middle as the you know, uh, as the earth, well, we did, I didn't have green or blue clay, so I used a different color. So it's fine as long as they do understand that that's the earth. So this is one of my students right here, um, coding in action. So here are some of the students' presentation. They introduced themselves in Hopi. And so you will probably hear them, you know, speak in Hopi in the beginning of their presentation and show their 3D models. Uh, 3D models of the easy satellite. Well, at first I didn't really show them, you know, I really didn't show them what the easy mission satellite looks like. So I told them, you know what, I want you to code and print a satellite that you have in mind. What do you think it looks like? So it was a little bit challenging for them, you know? And so I gave them a, a worksheet that's, you know, the engineering process, how did they problem solve and what not, you know? And so you will see two different kinds of um, 3D models that they will be showing you, okay? All right, let's see. No, we can't hear, no sound yet. Okay, um, Mr. Thomas, I think this is what I was asking you earlier. Where can I share the sound? Let me see. Oh, I see it now. Okay, hopefully you guys will be able to hear it. Um, yes. My name is Kevin Josaitua. Um, my Hopi name is Navaya Young, and I'm from the village of Sangopavi, and my clan is Bear. Um, Right here, this is my original satellite, which I had worked on previously before Ms. Naha had showed us the Easy satellite. Uh, during the Easy satellite, is a bit hard to code because I didn't have much inspiration to work with. I it was pretty much just a cube and solar panels, and then I tried to add a camera on it. But uh, with that, it ended up becoming like spaghetti underneath. Um, with that, though, I uh, recoded it, but I didn't um, print it out yet. But um, I recoded it and it looks much better. Okay, that's Kevin Josaitiwa, a sixth grade student. And then this one is Lily Ann, a third grade.
My name is Lily Ann, and my whole family name is Kotsuzniv, and I am um, from Korea, and I am from the village of all of it. And um, I want to show you the, my projects that I made. This is the first model I made when I first got into date. Um, the satellite for um, Cody. And, um, my other project I made in Easy, the real satellite that uh, I coded after the um, first satellite I made, and um, <clears throat> the first time this this got printed out, um, it went wrong, so I had to do do this a couple of times. So um, then um, after one, uh, when I fixed it, I um, this finally printed out, and then. Um, for this one, this printed out on the first try, and um, 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 and for the uh, real version of the satellite, and um, okay, here's another yeah, student. satellite I was working on um, before Miss Naha showed us the easy the easy wave and making then yeah this is it right here and it it looks weird because then I, I did the the panel weird and it looks like like it like it shrinks up there like up here then it's big down here so I'm gonna recode it again to see if I can make it better. Hi, my name is Cyrus. Uh, my clan is Tobacco and I do not know which village I am from. Uh, I am 12 years old and I am in fifth grade and I have made two satellite models. This is the first model. I have had to uh, create this model at least two times, but here's the first model. And this is the second one I have made. I guess something in my coding went wrong to where this one has been destroyed. But I have had a great time making this and that's about it, to be honest. The Kiara Harvey Young Fahan Matsuwa, the Bitsaman Young Hopi Matsuwa, Sapalu Naksino, the Kalungwa. This is my satellite. And um, I don't, I don't know. There was another one, but I couldn't print it because um, I, I um, <laughs> I didn't code it right, so it didn't really print out. And <laughs> that's it. This is my first um, creation I ever made, and then this is my replica of it, and then this is my easy mission satellite I made. Okay. Yeah, and this is my, uh, yeah, today my name is Carl Fujito. My clans are Nakai, Nakai, and Mishlai, Bilagana, but she, as she hint, that she changed Nakai, Deshanelle. This is my first model of my satellite in the 3D printing. The problem with this was just the base, so I need to recode that. And this is my easy mission replica of the satellite on there. We studied it. And the problem with this was the size of it, but I fixed it, the base and how big it was.
Okay, so um, that is for um, the easy mission satellite. So they did their version of it. I know it's not the real thing, but they tried. And then we had so many problem solving that we have done. And a quite a few times I tell you that, you know, we have to uh, recode it. The students have to recode it. I have to reprint it so many times. But what I will show you next one is a collaborative learning. So I kind of wanted to uh, step it up a little bit. You know, I wanted, um, I wanted this to be a school-wide thing in the future, if not this coming school year, the following year. So we did a peer tutoring with robotics, Legos uh, spike prime kits with coding. And we all know that peer tutoring is an effective educational strategy for classrooms of diverse learnings because uh, we because we also have students that are non-natives here as well. So in order for us to implement this one, the program can be, you know, it will be successful uh, not only in the classroom level, but of course in a wider scale at the wider scale at this school or our school. And here are some of the pictures and videos of our fifth graders partner up with uh, second grade and third graders. So I actually talked to the two uh, fifth grade teachers and they were willing to share their expertise, you know, with the students, of course, um, with my students in second grade classroom. The one that you've seen earlier were gifted and talented students. This time, these are also the gifted and talented students, but with the other students as well. They're very familiar with, you know, with the robotics already, you know, thank you for Mrs. Navinma and Mrs. Yaiva for um, letting me, letting my students work with the fifth graders. So here are the, uh, some of the pictures. They've done this uh, last week. Oh, you should have seen my students. My students were so happy. They love the collaboration. They love what they have learned with their older siblings, older brothers and sisters. Um, Sunway, what is the goal of your robot, Melissa? Okay, before I show this one, uh, I told the I told the group, you know, you have to have a goal in mind. What is your goal, and how are you going to problem solve that? Because I wanted my second grade students to to know how to problem solve. I know it's as simple as. Legos, you know, but they were able to figure it out. Let's find out. So. Um, we're trying to make it fast and straight. Because it keeps on going to the other side. All right. Let's see it. Is it working straight? No. So what are you guys going to do? Fix it. Fix it. Okay, that's just one. You made it turn around now. <laughs> now the next goal is to just make it move straight while it's turning around. And we made a little sound about that too. One of these. Mm -hmm. And for... Okay. <laughs> They're so excited. Marquise, so what is what is the goal for your robot? It's it's for it to move. Okay, let's see. All right, and so these are some of the pictures as well. Oh, this one did a show, but basically, you know, this the students were working with the upper grade with the fifth graders. So those are the pictures and um, videos. So our next goal is the reason why we started this already before the end of the school year. Actually, yesterday was our last day of school. Um, we wanted the students to be ready for coding this coming school year. That's the goal. And I was actually um, wanting to start that, you know, sometime in August already when school starts. And I wanted to introduce the robotics to the students as well, introduce them with coding, and at the same time, start 3D printing. And of course, kind of, you know, let them understand what is Aurora Borealis, not only for my gifted students, but also for the second graders. 
So thank you. And hopefully you enjoyed our videos. Asli Salamat. Thank you so very much. What very, very impressive, outstanding and and uh, just mind blowing. I, I really appreciate how well you you really enforce the iterative or problem solving process throughout the engineering experience and and that the children are immersed in that engineer's mindset. Uh, and thank you. And with that, Dr. Nancy Maryboy, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, all the teachers. I, this is always my favorite part is to see what the students are doing. Um, and I and I, and with the guidance they're getting and the uh, resources they're getting and the materials they're getting, um, you know, the sky's the limit because they really catch on fast and, and it's very inspiring for them and for us. Now I'm going to um, introduce uh, Dr. David Begay, my colleague and the vice president of IEI. And he is going to, he's a traditional knowledge holder and he's been having trouble with his um, Wi-Fi, but it looks like right now he's on. So David, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Okay. Thank you. Um uh Yeah. Don't my discussion. Um I've uh, listened to uh, the presentation all the way uh, I think they're incredible uh, presentations and projects that uh, people are working on students are working on and uh, hat uh, goes off to uh, incredible uh, work that they're doing um, I think whenever uh, you go cross culture uh, any indigenous uh, culture uh and uh and when you juxtapose it with uh, uh euro american um uh, knowledge it's very hard and it's a very complicated process because you're going across culture and you, you're um going across definition and uh and they're not the same definition most of the time and so you have to go to great extent trying to explain a lot of things, you know, going both ways. And so I don't know uh, to what extent uh, you were able to do these things. Uh, uh, it sounds like um, um, you did some of those things. Uh, you know, one of the things that... Um, I know Native people run across is uh, uh, that uh, they have to uh, give and take. Uh, and most of the time they give. They have to give up a way of thinking to, um, to talk the language of the science. And, uh, and I think it's the other way around. Um, uh, uh, whenever you go from uh, uh, science to uh, native knowledge, you know, in incredible uh, transition that goes on in, uh, in the knowledge, um, meaning that you know everything works together. And uh, so um, when you were talking about the the aurora borealis, the way some of the native talk about um, the auroras, it's uh, it's coming through the interaction of Earth and you see the sun's action. The, uh, the aurora, what you see is the, it's the sun doing, interacting with earth. And, uh, and 
in in Navajo, um, uh, whirlwind, for example, here on on Earth, uh, elders say it's the sun doing. You see tornado, it's the sun doing it. It's the interaction between the earth and the sun. When you see a hurricane, it's the sun's action. So a lot of these things that we were talking about in science can be um, can be translated. Uh, for example, the the charged particle that people talk about. You know, we have a word. We call it Jonah Epitzil, Bijol, and and then uh, the solar flares, the sunlight, Shabbat Ol, and uh, electromagnetism. We see Shabbat Ol, it's actually Shigi. It's you know charged particle, and you know Thomas was talking about. We have those in stories, uh, and uh, and the story goes that uh, at one at one time in the history, going way back. So uh, and, and people find out that it needs an internal energy internal fire for the earth to, to rotate so the, make a long story short the fire was uh, acquired from the sun and put in the interior core of the sun then the then the earth started moving so here's the story but uh in in, in talking to some of the scientists you know it that the Earth's core interacts with everything else. It's in everything is holistic. Everything works with one another. And uh, and, and 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 it's true for everything. You know, it, it, there's a a field of uh, tendencies that's uh, associated with itself. In, in a spectrum of potentialities of, of which things will unfold, you know, and then some of these uh, tendencies are quantum tendencies, you know, they're, uh, you know, they come in the form of waves and they're, they're, you can't see, but people say they act up on one, on one another. So when it comes to uh, uh, Borealis, um, it's the mother, mother Earth and Father Sky interacting. It's a self-organizing dynamic, you know, and uh, and and so the is you know a universe. You know, it's pretty much like uh, gravity. You're trying to define gravity, and uh, in among our elders, they say it's the it's it's the universe that makes gravity gravity. I'll stop here. Thank you, David. Very interesting, and I know we could go on for a long time, but I think we're um, coming toward the end of this session. Um, I'm going to pass this back to Tom Thomas now to. Um, uh, do a, a question and answer period. We might have to cut it a little bit short, Tom, because we're mm -hmm. r running over time a bit. Mm -hmm. So um, let me turn it back to you. Yeah. So um, yes, Brad, I'd like to go ahead and, and visit, start start with you and on the questions. And one is is what is your personal why behind doing outreach as a subject matter expert with schools for the easy mission? Well, well, thank you. First and foremost, I, I honestly feel like, how am I going to follow up on these presentations? Uh, it's just baffling. It just makes me smile. And I think perhaps that is the reason why. 
you just confirm what this is all about. This is some of the most fun I've had in my entire career. But let me just spend one minute. When I grew up in a small country called Denmark in, 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 in Europe, we have a saying, we have a poem of a little boy that keeps asking questions. And the parents get tired of him, sends him to bed without dinner. And when I was a little boy, I didn't understand that poem at all. I didn't understand what it was all about. Why are they sending you to bed? Because he's asking questions. And to this day, I don't like it. <laughs> if you, you had the aurora in Arizona, just as you, somebody pointed out, and if somebody looks up at the northern light they see this beautiful display and they had one of our magnetometers on ground, they will see this magnetometer make a, a, a movement and yet they will see action and they could look up at the aurora and start wondering. And I think if we can possibly convey this to the kids that asking questions about the world you live in is a good thing, you won't be sent to bed without dinner. In fact, you might even make a life out of it. And that's what I have done. I have a good living and I have a wonderful life for asking questions. And my again, my wife does give me dinner, right? So so I think my personal why is inspire and tell kids, ask questions and wonder. That's important. Thank you so very much. That, that was awesome. And um and thank you for all you do um and and, and teaching us. And uh, Sandra, Sandra, I'm going to go ahead and ask you the follow-up question. Um, what are some ways that you can imagine that students would interact with the easy mission representatives and, and representatives being broadly, you know, uh, uh, other Maverick teachers and classes, as well as subject matter experts. Um, for example, I, I believe you were there when Dr. Masavi zoomed into our fifth, sixth grade class, and she did just a phenomenal job coming across, presenting the information so eloquently at our fifth, sixth grade uh, uh, uh levels of, of reasoning and thinking and building upon their background knowledge, but as an auntie and as a mom, it was just so soothing to hear her come across that way. And um, what are some ways that you imagine that students can interact with the easy mission? Sandra. My goodness. I just have to take a second also to say hello and say that everyone was amazing. And my heart is just beating so hard because it's always, I'm just so proud to be a member of the easy team, the easy family, we call ourselves. Um, um, it's filled with amazing folks. And, you know, I'll start with, and the teachers, again, I'm a teacher, just I'm a teacher by trade. And so it's an honor um, to work at APL and to be able to help coordinate this type of programming. And congratulations, because I learned so much from you. And thank you so much. Um, so the easy mission and the outreach mission is about connection. And so, you know, I hope that, you know, my why in doing this is that giving more and more access to science is what's most important to me. It's breaking down barriers and teaching that science is really about exploring the world and that we all have kids inside of us, like Jesper, or myself, like these folks that never grow up that wants this sense of wonder. Um, and to go to bed at night with a greater sense of wonder and satisfaction about exploring the world. So um, the Maverick teachers, other teachers, everyone who wants to get involved, we actually at the EZ mission will be offering webinars that are open to learn about the mission, uh, to learn about more about the EZ mag, which is the ground magnetometer kits that Nellie mentioned and Jesper mentioned. Um, and that we're accessible and that the subject matter experts are available for question and answer sessions and follow up to be able to come into the classroom in a variety of ways. So um, the like I'll finish up with that Nali mentioned, and I want to reiterate that this is the first NASA mission that outreach is integral to the mission itself. Um, and so hopefully that really is a testament to demonstrate that we want to connect um, in such an authentic way and in whatever way that we can, that we're adapting to the needs of our audience as well and providing um, the solutions that are desired of us as well so we can be responsive and provide the um, content um, that's desired so to make it fun. So hopefully... You all know that you can sign up and go to our website, sign up for our newsletter, 
at the most immediate action and get informed about the mission and figure out more how you can get involved with the easy outreach as well as easy mag. Yeah, Sandra, I can't wait till we get the magnetometers in our hands and see the looks on the children's faces. Um, Troy, I'm going to go ahead and throw a question towards you. I know you've been working with outreach education for for a long time, and you've been so influential in what we're doing here. Um, what is your personal why behind doing outreach with schools for easy? You know, long ago, Nancy, and I remember, and I think Chris, you might have been there as well, maybe David, but we had talked a bit about the future of uh, what it might look like for outreach and education uh, on reservation schools with indigenous kids and and working in science and working with various missions and who know who knew what was going to come in the future. And one of the really pertinent conversations I'll never forget was the conversation centered around flipping the paradigm. And it was basically instead of the Western world bringing content and and, and activities and a program that was ready made and bring it to indigenous world communities and saying, here you go, do this. Instead of doing that, um, why not flip that paradigm around, bring the content, bring the experts there, embrace the experts within the indigenous communities and start the program there like this Maker Place program and let those students in turn become the thought leaders. Let them be the ones that figure out how all of this works, how it should work based on their own cultural values. And then teach the rest of the world from, from that point of view, just flip that whole model around. And I think we're starting to see uh, the evidence of that philosophy and that conversation and, and with the power of what can happen when that goes on. So my why is finding people where they are and valuing what they do and hold sacred and, and, and bringing that to light, like through a variety of programs and ideas and letting us work together in a way to make something really valuable, even more valuable. Thank you so much. And um, Sandra, I'm going to toss you another question to you. How can people be a part of the easy community and, and get more involved? So you, as you were saying earlier, the citizen scientists with the magnetometers, where are some additional ways that you that you envision people being involved with the easy community? Oh, OK. So I'll take a step back. The magnetometer is part of an international ground network of magnetometer readings. And so everyone can be a citizen science uh, scientist by looking at the easy mag data that will be made available um, on our website. And it, you'll see live data streams of all the magnetometers that will deploy all over the world and see you know, where there are spikes in the data that are demonstrating solar weather. Um, and they'll be provide, I'll provide like, um, data activities to further analyze the data and hopefully the citizen scientists can start to become space weather predictors does that sound like fun that sounds and can we say fun. that all the schools will be getting a magnetometer kit to build is that in sometime in november yes in the maker place um program for all of the teachers will receive the easy mag to participate in the program. That's really exciting. And um, Sandra, I wonder if you could put in the chat, maybe your newsletter at how could we get your newsletter? Excellent. I'll put the web page. Okay. Tom, or I think yes. we're almost at the end of our time. Yeah, um, we'll just turn it back over to you. We could go another hour. This is, I, I like Jesper, I think this has been such a fun presentation and, and time. And me, I was just glued to it like, like this the whole, whole way through. I just appreciated all that everybody did. Um, I want to also, I want to thank three people, uh, especially here. I'd like to thank Tom for his guidance, direction, and enthusiasm. It's just been wonderful, as always, to work with you. I'd like to thank Chris Taran for all the work you did this. We didn't have a coyote, except a little bit during David's presentation, whatever that's going to mean. Um, but anyway, um, it, it all went so smoothly and was so interesting. And I'd like to thank our very dear old friend, Troy Klein, because we always 
love doing pro anytime he says something like jump we jump because it's so fun to work with him and it's always so rewarding so i think um i think at this point we will close it i do want to say that all this was all recorded and if you'd like to have a um have the session go to our website which is indigenouseducation.org and chris will be sending that out to you and um and um you will find it there in a week or two and you can download it for free and you can use it in your classroom you can do whatever you want with it but it will be there for you um and uh let me see is there anything else yes we're, we're going to send you a small questionnaire at the end of this and we hope you'll fill it out because this is how we get a, a little feedback on how people in, enjoyed the um uh, the session so i think at that point this point i will thank you all for being here with us today and hope you all have a happy memorial day weekend <laughs>